basically K is a, is a project for writing down programming languages in. So it's a language building language is what I tell people. Uh, and so we have built the languages uh, C and Java and JavaScript and we're working on C++ and we have Python and we have a lot of other big languages and also some network semantics and stuff like that. Um, so basically, uh, once you write down your language in K, you have both a formal specification in terms of a human readable document and you have a, uh, a range of tools essentially that you can use for experimenting on both your language design as well as for running programs and things like that. So you get a parser out of it, an interpreter, you get a model checker, um, a deductive program verifier, and uh, we're working on some, some new uh, exciting tools as well. Uh, at IC3, the EVM semantics uh, was already finished actually. It started as kind of a side project in a class and then it, someone approached us uh, and asked us to finish it and gave us um, a convincing amount of money to do so. And the, uh, at IC3, basically, I just extended that semantics uh, to include some kind of higher level language constructs in EVM. So it was just a few uh, days working on that, but basically I added things like while loops and if statements and uh, assignment and local variables uh, and structured control flow um, to the EVM and then just had a small compiler down to uh, EVM itself. And I called that language EVM prime. Uh, the compiler is written all in K, it's about 250 lines of literate K code, so most of it's actually documentation. Um, so it was fairly compact, and that just kind of speaks to how easy it is to build new languages in K. Uh, and right now, that project is being used to, um, so we're writing tests for EVM Prime, essentially, and then we're also extending it to kind of, our goal is something like a Viper minus minus, so that we can, uh, very easily compile Viper contracts into this EVM prime or this Viper minus minus thing and then the remainder of the compilation can kind of be well controlled and well understood. Um, and then also out of that what you'll get is all those tools for Viper contracts, right? You'll get a program verifier and a model checker, symbolic execution engine, um, all those tools immediately for Viper contracts as well. Um, and then hopefully also EVM prime will serve as a nice compilation target for other high level languages um, one of the other things we were thinking about maybe doing was targeting LLL, if people are familiar with that, um, as another slightly higher level language, and then that would kind of give us the benefits of having all the LLL tool chains available to us. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we're open to suggestions in terms of how people would like to see that evolve, and, yeah, we'll keep on working on it and building more languages on top of EVM directly. So I think that's about it. Any questions real quick? Or? Cool, yeah, so uh, my project was writing secure smart contracts and we had probably the biggest team at the bootcamp. I think there were like 10 people on it or something like that. Um, and it was sort of meant to be a dual purpose project, both educational and constructive for the community. So uh, how many people here have heard of Hack This Site? Anybody? Used Hack This Site? Okay, a few of you. Um, so I think a great way to train people, train Solidity developers and smart contract developers in the ecosystem on how to write secure smart contracts and how to write proper code that lasts a long time <coughs> is by actually having them getting their hands dirty and uh, breaking other smart contracts. So the first thing we sort of did was we got all of our 10 people together in a room and we had them write an ERC-20 with uh, no other instructions other than that, just sit down and write an ERC-20. Um, and then sort of me and a few other people went through and audited their ERC-20s and pointed out to them all of the ways in which we could possibly break them. Um, after that, we had them fix their ERC-20s and go through the re-auditing process until they had correct ERC-20s. Um, and then sort of the second half of the project was to build out this platform, uh, Hack This Contract. So you can access it at hackthiscontract.io. Um, and the way it works is there's five or six uh, example contracts on there that are intentionally vulnerable. Uh, you deploy them on the Rinkeby testnet. All you have to do is give it your Rinkeby address and then have at it, try to hack the contracts and see if you can actually break um, these things. So uh, future work directions, there's a few features missing from the site, which you'll see if you try to use it. I still think it's totally usable and, and fun today. Um, so adding those in is obviously sort of priority zero. Um, after that, I'd like to add in all of the wonderful submissions we had to the underhanded solidity contract, uh, contest, which you guys heard about earlier today in the main room, um, as well as examples of all the past hacks. So I would like new solidity developers to sort of come in and be able to reproduce the DAO hack themselves and write that attack contract. Um, and I think that, that by doing so, we're sort of educating people on how you can write smart contracts incorrectly um, and indirectly getting them to write smart contracts more correctly. 
So I think it's a super fun approach, and I think you'll feel good if you uh, log on and try to break a few of these things. Cool. Hey, uh, I'm Nate. I work with Loy on a project called Peace Relay. Um, so first of all, to start off, who here has heard of BTC Relay? All right, a couple people. Uh, the general idea is that there's a smart contract on the Ethereum chain that imports block headers from Bitcoin. Um, and once you have block headers from Bitcoin in a smart contract, what you can do is you can provide proofs of transaction inclusion in those blocks to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so an interesting use case might be something along the lines of, oh, you know, pay me money to my Bitcoin address, and if you do, I'll give you Ether in a trustless manner. Um, and so this is pretty much what we can do with this idea of relay contracts, like cross-chain cross relay contracts. So the project that we worked on, Peace Relay, essentially we're trying to do that for any two EVM-based chains. Um, essentially relay contracts between two EVM-based chains. Um, over the course of the boot camp, uh, we built out one of these, um, and we were actually the, you know, pretty big stuff here, the first ever people to move Robston Ether onto Rinkby. Right, I know, huge. Um, um, and the idea is that you lock an asset on one chain, you can then provide a proof to the other chain using this piece relay contract that that asset was locked, and what it does is it instantiates like a, you know, an asset-backed token, ERC token, that backs the asset on the other chain. Um, you can move that asset around in the second chain however much you want, and when you wanna eventually move back, you can burn it on this chain and then provide a proof over here that you've actually burned it. Um, you know, other than that, there's a, cother, a couple other interesting applications, um, which Lloyd will talk about. Right, so I mean, the immediate application is that, you know, you can move uh, like ETC or any other EVM, uh, you know, uh, back coins, right? Like NEO or so like Golem, uh, sorry, uh, NEO and QTEM to uh, Ethereum, and so that, you know, all the decentralized changes on Ethereum can trade, you know, between tokens and, and this coin. Um, so another application is that, you know, now you can actually, um, you know, move private coins, right, in, in some private chain because of the, um, uh, you know, uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. So, so many people are like building private blockchain with their own asset, right? So you can actually like move the asset in, 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 in the private chain to the uh, public chain and then, you know, trade between this coin uh, and other uh, ESC20 tokens. Um, um, Just checking uh, about the Alaska Camera stuff. Right, can, can you add something yeah, about yeah. that? Yeah, so the, the other interesting thing that you could possibly do is you could imagine kind of, so the idea is like, you know, with Peace Relay, one EVM chain can become aware of another EVM chain. Um, the other interesting thing that you might be able to do is kind of point the, the Peace Relay contract at, at the chain that it's actually on. Uh, and, that, and that might not make much sense, but kind of the idea is we can make the EVM more aware of what's actually happening in the EVM. Um, so for example, um, as kind of a spin-off of this project, one thing that kind of came out of the summer was uh, essentially a gas oracle. Uh, and so kind of you can imagine that like the, the EVM kind of becomes aware of how much gas is actually being used um, on the EVM. Uh, the reason that's interesting, you know, you can imagine like, you know, if there's this much gas used, if there's more than 50% of gas used in the last 100 blocks, extend the time lock on this state channel, state channel timeout um, and other interesting things like that. Um, right now, Peace Relay is uh, being maintained by two different teams. Uh, the first team is uh, Kyber Network and DAPBase. And the second one is, uh, I guess, consensus uh, in the ice relay project. And uh, from Kyber Network side, we are planning to release uh, some uh, beta version of uh, Peace Relay by the end of this month or early early next month. So please keep in touch. Any other question for Peace Relay? All right. Uh, so in typical runner-up fashion, I actually prepared a presentation. Uh, so let me just run through that real quick. So our uh, project was front-running Bancor. It was done by uh, myself, Hasib Qureshi, Yvonne Bogatti, and Preeti Kassaretti. So, um, so quick, uh, okay, that's not working, that's cool. So uh, quick note, so this research, so we did this at IC3, uh, and then we published the research on October 10th. At the same time, we worked with the Bancor team before we actually published to address the vulnerability and put out some fix so that it wasn't so vulnerable to this. Um, I just want to point out the Bancor team was, was cooperative in analyzing the attack, pushing out a fix. Uh, so I want to give props where it's due. This is still an early space. People mess up all the time. So, you know, blockchain development is really hard. Um, so that was cool. So what is front running? Front running is a term that originated back in the stock market, uh, in, back in the days when trades were executed on paper. So literally what would happen is a broker would receive a large buy order from a client, and they might say this out loud so other people could hear, and they would go walk over to the desk to perform the trade. A malicious trader would basically hear that this was going on or see this was going on, and literally run in front of them to put in a buy or sell uh, ahead of time to profit and sort of sandwich their, their transaction in between. Uh, now, you can do the same thing on a blockchain. Uh, if a miner or user sees an unconfirmed transaction in the mempool that they can profit from, they can squeeze their own transaction 
to come in front. Uh, so essentially, you're profiting from a beneficial reordering of the transactions. Now, as a miner, this is pretty easy because the, the way that mining essentially works is that uh, you are sort of the leader for a moment, so you get to decide what goes in that block. And so you can reorder transactions however you want if you manage to mine that block. Uh, as a user, however, you can actually manipulate where you go in a block by changing your gas price. And most mining clients will sort mine transactions by the gas price. So if you come in higher than somebody else, you'll come in before somebody else in the serialized execution. So many blockchain market protocols are vulnerable to minor front running, um, but it doesn't seem to really happen very much in practice that we can observe. Uh, plus, uh, miners can only front run in blocks that they themselves happen to mine, right? So unless we're coordinating among a big mining pool, if I'm a malicious miner, I only get to front run in, uh, if I happen to mine a block, which is very, very rare for any individual miner. However, if your protocol can be front run by random users, uh, that's really bad. Because that means that any user who's sitting on the blockchain looking for transactions can, run every, can front run any transaction that they want to. Uh, so Bankroll was known to be vulnerable to minor front running, as many marketplaces are, but we demonstrated that it was vulnerable to user front running, meaning any user on the network could front run Bankroll transactions and make money. So uh, how does Bancor work, for those of you who are not familiar? Uh, Bancor is basically uh, an automated liquidity provider using a smart contract. It, it gives you deterministic pricing by maintaining a constant reserve ratio. Okay, so long story short, if you buy, the price goes up. If you sell, the price goes down. That's, that's the, the law of the land for Bancor. Okay, so uh, what that means is that if I know someone's going to buy, I know the price is going to go up. Great. So uh, the attack is pretty simple. You launch a geth node and you write a little bit of Python script to basically monitor the mempool and see what transactions are going in the network. Uh, if, you can, if you can tell that the transaction is one that qualifies as being worth front running, which that's basically what that's doing, um, then all you do is you increment your gas price a little bit more than what they paid. So you can see one G way more than them. Uh, then you, you launch the transaction. Uh, and if all goes well, you should have front run them. So, Running simulations, we show that over a two-month period of, of July and August, uh, with 100 ETH principal, you would have produced $35,000 in return uh, for front-running transactions on the main, assuming that you know, the, the, the market or the people in the network didn't react, uh, which is greater than 100% ROI over that period of time. Uh, we also show that uh, because Bancor is a protocol that can be used by many different tokens, the smaller the token market cap, the higher your ROI would be for front-running that market. Uh, and so if, if there were a large number of, of tokens that were using Bancor at that time, you would have been able to make even more. Um, and so we also front ran a single transaction on the mainnet just to prove that this was in fact doable, uh, which we did. We returned the delta that we made to the person who originally made the transaction and then didn't front run any further. Um, so how can you mitigate this kind of attack? So this is kind of endemic to blockchains, but there are several ways to try to mitigate it. So uh, one thing you could do uh, is force all buys or sells to specify an acceptable price range. So you could say, okay, I'll, I'll make this transaction, but only if the price uh, offered by the market maker is P plus or minus some epsilon. Uh, otherwise, cancel the transaction. Uh, if you do that, this can't be front run by other miners or users because you're guaranteeing yourself a certain price. Uh, however, this leaks important metadata. If someone front runs you and then your transaction is canceled, they kind of know, let's say you were going to buy you know, a million bank or, right? Well, okay, maybe your, your transaction got canceled, but they know someone's trying to buy a million Bancor. So they know that Bancor is going to go up. So if they buy a bunch of Bancor and they know eventually you're planning to buy, uh, they know that they can just wait for your buy to come in and then they can sell. Uh, so this also significantly limits your throughput. So if, if lots of transactions are happening on, on Bancor, then it's very hard to ascertain uh, how wide that epsilon should be so that your transaction doesn't sort of get canceled innocuously. Right? Um, so uh, otherwise, you, you just have to accept some margin of, of front running that you're okay with if that epsilon, you know, ideally, obviously if you're buying, you, you're okay with the price going down, but you wouldn't want it to go up. Um, so it's not a great compromise, but it is better than nothing. Um, however, what you can do is you can set a maximum allowable gas price for the contract. So essentially what that does is it puts an upper limit on what people are allowed to pay to try to get in front of line of each other, right? Um, so this is, this is nice because it, it can't be front run by users. However, it's still vulnerable to minor front running because minor can do, miners can do whatever they want. Uh, it's, not, it's not really, you know, they're not beholden to, to uh, accepting these rules. Um, so it's also vulnerable to transaction flooding by malicious users, but this is expensive and difficult in practice and not really something that people have seen. Um, so this is a solution that Bancor settled on. It's a decent compromise between UX and security. Everything still happens in one transaction, just a few extra parameters you have to send up. Um, now, the ideal solution would be some form of commit reveal. Um, so in a commit reveal, this, these are well known for voting schemes. Uh, in a commit reveal, you first commit to the transaction you're gonna make by uh, sending a hash of the transaction plus some nonce. Uh, then you reveal the transaction and nonce in a subsequent block. Unfortunately, for a commit reveal to work, it has to span multiple blocks to actually make a trade. So this is kind of undesirable, right? Like, you know, in the span of two blocks, things can change. It's just kind of a slow, crappy UX. Um, but this is the safest scheme. Now, doing this naively is still vulnerable to certain attacks. 
Uh, so Submarine Sands was actually worked on by uh, Lorenz Breidenbach, Phil Diane, Ari Jules, and uh, Florian Tramere, where they proposed a scheme for accomplishing this securely, uh, which, is, which is a lot easier with the Create2 opcode, uh, which is uh, offered by EIP86, which is not going to come out in Metropolis, unfortunately. Uh, so we're still waiting on that. Uh, we're also exploring other practical commit reveal schemes that are possible with, with current opcodes. So uh, that is front running. There was me, uh, me, Preeti, Yvonne. Special thanks to Ari Jules, Ido Bentov, and Carl Flourish for helping us in our research, and of course to IC3. Thanks. Thanks, guys.